thing going through the yeah. well, kind of different range. Uh, uh, Yeah, um, mute this. Mute. Then we won't be able to hear it outside. I can hear your music. Correct. Okay. Right. Okay. 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 Hello everybody and welcome. Um, we are letting the Zoom audience in as well as the real life audience um, tonight. So welcome to everyone here in real life and welcome to all the people who have just joined us on Zoom. We are going to um, get underway soon. Um, if there are people who are still needing seats, and you're needing a seat? No. Uh, if there are people who are still needing seats, there's two seats in the front row. Um, so feel free to come down and use those. Um, also for the people here um, in the audience here, um, we have toilets upstairs. So just behind the counter up the stairs. If your mobility, mobility is a problem, um, come and see the staff and we will let you into a um, not as nice um, outside. <laughs> just toilet. I clean them this up. Very clean, it? not nice outside toilet. Um, <laughs> So do come and see us and we'll, we'll, it's down that way if you if you need to. Um, now, I think that's, uh, and also the book at the moment is front and centre at the counter for everyone here in the shop. If you haven't seen it already, there's a stack of them there and there's more behind the counter. So um, after this event, we're going to mob um, Steve and we're going to get him to sign all our copies, which is always the best thing about a launch, which is fantastic. <laughs> And also before we start, um, if you haven't COVID checked in, um, we are going to have to get you to, um, to I'll, I'll COVID check in. So if anyone hasn't COVID checked in, can you put your hand up? <laughs> if you, uh, like I know it's shame, but <laughs> can you please just let us know? It's very, very important that um, we don't get fined thousands of dollars for this gathering tonight. <laughs> Oh, Steve. Okay. <laughs> now we know the culprit. Steve has not covered checked in. So we're going to do that now. Um, we are very, very sorry for people getting a million emails from us as we um, had to very, very quickly, as they say, pivot. I'm actually going to say that because it was a, a, a pirouette, I think, as we managed to get this massive audience into two halves. Um, which was actually quite a juggling feat and um, Jana um, made all of that happen. So um, that was really fantastic to be able to move an audience of 80 to an audience of 40 um, in a very quick period of time, two audiences of 40. So we're really happy to be able to still have this event, even though it was going to exceed our COVID safe rules. Um, and now we've got two events that are COVID safe. So that's fantastic. Um, so hooray for that. <laughs> 
has been a bit of a week of doing that, but it's the Festival of Steve now, so that's even better. It's two weeks. <laughs> it's two weeks of Steve. He'll be on the bestseller list for three weeks in a row now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was worth it, wasn't it? <laughs> that's the plan. That's the plan. He planned this COVID. He brought it to Queensland. Um, all right. <laughs> Maybe he didn't bring it to Queensland. <laughs> Okay, so I'd like to start um, this event off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on in this area, the Yagra and the Turrbal people, and I'd like to pay my deepest respects to Elders past, present, um, and any other Elders who are here with us tonight. Um, it always was and always will be Aboriginal land, and I'd particularly like to acknowledge the Elders in this NAIDOC week as well. I hope that everybody's been enjoying the NAIDOC celebrations. I certainly have been seeing a lot of um, Radio National NAIDOC content and enjoying it thoroughly. Um, now, um, I'd also like to acknowledge that because we're on Zoom to quite a large audience tonight, we are Zooming out onto the lands of many different Aboriginal peoples. And I would like to acknowledge um, the traditional elders of all of the areas that you are meeting on there tonight. This always was, always will be Aboriginal land and sovereignty was never ceded. So um, without further ado, actually, if anyone in the room here has their phones on, um, can you switch it to silent um, so that they don't go off in the middle? Um, and if you are a social media person, feel free to tweet to Facebook, to Instagram, or to do anything else that I do not know about, because that's it. That's all the social media I can get in my head. Um, but if you have anything else, please do it. That's completely fine. Chrissy's sitting there. Uh, I might oh, have to get one more seat. Though. That's all right. That's good, but or you'll have to host just Zoom. Giving away the host. <laughs> so for the Zoom audience too, um, we are going to put um, the link. In the, um, in the chat function to the book, Paradiso. And so you'll see that come through and that will be where you can purchase the book. You can click on that link and purchase the book. It's also where you can put questions if we have time for questions at the end. We'll see how we go. Um, so without further ado, I would actually like to um, kick the evening off with um, some music because tonight we have not one but two special performances to begin to bookend the evening and um, at the beginning we have a song performed by Camilla Pavarotti with David DeSanti. Camilla Pavarotti is from Ferrari in Italy and has lived in Queensland since 2002. She sings and acts in the Italian theatre group in Brisbane, Dan, Dan Teatro, of which she is a founding member. She is also a dedicated member of the Queensland Kodali Choir and Unicoro the Italian choir based in the Dante Society. David DeSanti is a first generation Italian Australian with family roots in Vallo della Luciano in the Campania region of Italy. David began playing the piano accordion at the tender age of 10, urged on by his father, Aniello. I've never been urged to play my piano accordion, but um, that's very nice of your father. Inflicted. <laughs> very nice of your father. Um, he is a driving force behind the local band Zumpa, which shares and celebrates traditional music from the old country. The song Camilla's chosen about emigration for tonight is a folk song. Mamma mia, damni centro lira. Did I get that right? No. <laughs> centro lira. Centro um, lira. Mamma, give me a hundred lira. Thank you. Uh, but its earliest name was La maledizione della madre. La maledizione della madre. Uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> the mother's curse. In brief, a young girl asks her mother for 100 lira, lira so she can go to America. The mother says, no way. But the brother says, let her go. So the mother says, off you go, ungrateful daughter, something will happen. And surely enough, the ship sinks. The daughter feeds the fish and the mother was right. Sounds very much like my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's associated particularly with a wave of immigration from rural Italy to the Americas. I'm surprised anyone got there um, in the second half of the 19th century. So please um, welcome our performers tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, my American 
So thank you so much for that. Amazing. Um, and what a great way to kick off tonight. Um, tonight we have a very, very special book and a very special writer, a very dear friend of Avid Reader, um, Steve Kaplan, who has been writing this book for a very long time. I think I was <laughs> possibly one of the very first readers of, a, um, of an early draft, which has been worked on so much that it is now a masterpiece. <laughs> Um, so Steve has written for theatre, published short stories and was a founding member of the West End based street arts community theatre company. He has worn many hats, including primary school teacher and professional clown, which he has never taken off. Um, <laughs> Steve is a descendant of the Italians who arrived in Australia in 1881 following their disastrous attempt to set up a utopian colony in New Guinea. He has been writing and researching for the past 10 years to understand what drove his family to make such a radical choice. In 2020, he was a contributor to the Our Inside Voices anthology published by And Also, and Paradiso is his first novel. Welcome, Steve. Yay. And tonight, Steve will be in conversation with Avid Reader's very own co-owner, Fiona Steger. So welcome to Fiona. Do I need to do anything to turn this on? Chris? Yes, I'll, I'll turn on for you, Steve. It's double. It's a double. Yeah. <clears throat> so 
firstly, Steve, congratulations. It's a wonderful novel. I think you should be very proud of it. And I'm very proud of you. So I'm, I'm, I'm very Thanks, honoured. <laughs> no, I'm very honoured to be doing this conversation. Um, there's so much in it and uh, there's lots for us to unpick and talk about in terms of characters, plot, scenes and research. But first of all, let's Let's give our audience an overview. You did just reveal beforehand that you thought bored most of the audience here shitless talking about it, but there may be some people who don't know the story. So can you first of all give us an overview of Paradiso? I hate that question. <laughs> That's the hardest question in the in the list. Um, an overview. Um, okay, so 1879, 1880, Italy's just been established 18, in the 1860s. Um, Veneto is the last province to join in 1866. The Italian government begins taxing people. There's a series of terrible um, seasons. And there's a group of, a little, a little group of Italians, 27 families, um, weird little group, 47 families, sorry, who, um, are restless. They all come from an area that you could throw a blanket over. Someone arrives with a message or with a they bump into someone on in a railway carriage somewhere who says, ah, hey, I've got a good idea. Let's all go get on a boat and travel across the seas to the Pacific and establish a, a, a colony. So these 47 families for, um, fall under this spell. I think it's a spell, really, almost a charm, um, because it's quite bizarre that so many people would choose at the same time to do this. And, yes, they sign up to the scheme. Most of them are illiterate peasants. They don't really know. Um, well, I can't even read the literature. The, there's a French marquis who's, uh, who's promoting this scheme. He's made a lot of money, raised money in France for this fabulous venture, which is going to reap everyone wealth and fabulous fortunes, including the Italians. The Italians, of course, are the, um, the bunnies in it because he needs a labour force to make all this happen, so he recruits these peasants. Now, to cut a long story short, um, the story then follows their passage for, from Italy to Marseille, Barcelona, and end up in the jungles of New Guinea, um, where things go to shit, as we said before, and then they eventually find their way to Australia. I mean, that's it in a nutshell. The story's told by two children on that voyage, um, Domenico, who's an eight-year-old, and his sister Marietta, um, who's a 13-year-old, and Marietta's descendants are here tonight, the Edwards family, and we should all welcome them because that's pretty fabulous to have um, a direct line from Marietta. Um, and I also, at this stage, Fiona would like to welcome Alan and Carolyn. Alan Hankinson is the last surviving um, member of my father's generation. So his mother, Katerina, was the last born of the mm. of the <laughs> the Australian born five children who uh, who um, to Lorenzo and Maria. A bit convoluted, but I just want to welcome them to session tonight. Does that give you an idea? It, I, I think that does. It gives us like the story arc. So it is a journey. Um, but, but why did you choose Marietta and Dominic as the two characters? Why did you choose to tell the story through the voices of two children? Yeah, that's a good question, Fiona. Um, uh, I've done this before, Steve. Yeah, but she hasn't told me what questions she's going to ask, so I'll be quick on my feet. Um, I do remember, um, well, I mean, the story emerged, I was sort of researching and thinking about that story for 10 years before I actually started to write. Um, I knew I had, and, and in writing it, I thought I wanted people to be really, um, feel as if they're really there. So I decided I wanted to tell it in the first person and the present tense. And it wasn't until years later that someone said, well, that's not a very good idea. Um, <laughs> that's a very hard mode of writing to write in. Um, but I also wanted to have, um, an innocence to it, so that it wasn't filtered by, you know, the adults going, oh, you know, this is a great idea, or oh, so, oh, woe is me when things go bad. I wanted, I wondered what it would be like for a child to be on an expedition like that, because it, were amaz it was an amazing range of people. So these 47 families, from the age of one to the age of 77 was the oldest on the journey. So it wasn't just fam, it was 
whole families uprooting themselves and going on this board. Quite amazing. And um, and a lot of children, more children than adults on the voyage, as it turned out. Um, and I started writing with Dominic, with Domenico, um, and seeing the world through his eyes. And I got into it and I got bored because I thought, uh, he only, well, with first person present, you can only tell what they actually see. You can't tell things beyond their experience or even what they're seeing immediately, you know, in their eyes. You can tell what they're feeling and talk about that. Uh, and I thought, oh, I need, I need a second voice. And I, I realised that I needed, uh, you know, a, a girl to balance Dominic. Dominic was eight years old and very excitable and running around saying, yeah, 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 let me at it. Um, I want to be a, a big hero and an adventurer. Marietta was 13, so she, her experience was going to be quite yeah. different. I think you've done that really well. You really get a sense of um, how they, how like that young, naive, excitable state of mind, and then a young woman on the um, cusp of womanhood, and how that changes um, her life as well. So you've done a beautiful job of of the, these characters, and there's also wonderful moments where you have. The women meeting a group of people in what was then called Salon. And then there's also another wonderful scene. It's the Christmas Day scene when they've finally arrived in, um, um, you know, Papua New Guinea. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, Port Britain. Um, and they're both very beautifully imagined. How did you balance the role of the author and imagination and your research. How did you work that fine line of imagination and staying true to facts? Um, writing's a really it's a strange thing, Fiona. Um, you keep, the story keeps surprising you. Um, I felt I, I sort of had Dominic pretty well, that's me. As a boy, um, you know, you mix yeah. characters are a mixture of whole things, but you know, he was excitable and adventurous. Um, uh, Marietta was really interesting to write because she's a girl, I'm not, um, and she's a young woman. But I, I actually enjoyed writing Marietta more than Dominic because I felt really a real warmth and um, tenderness to her story. Um, but I guess in writing those those examples you just gave in Salon. I had no idea that was going to happen, you know, and writers do talk about this, that sort of sometimes they say stories write themselves, but I, that's what I loved about the writing process. Um, they would get off the ship and go into the market in the, in the middle of um, Salon and um, there they'd encounter this um, man playing, a, um, you know, an instrument and, the, and a snake charmer and then a woman who's sort of a fortune teller and I just went, oh, wow. Well, I wonder what I wonder so, what's come going so to happen here. So there was nothing here. in diaries or anything. No, like that. that story just came to. <laughs> so the answer to your question is, um, is I hope it reads as if it's really true, but I assure you it's not. So all this, this, the bones of the story are true. The events, the dates, the destinations, the deaths are all true. Even the moon phases are true in the story. That was a funny little element to introduce. Um, but I made up, I imagined all of those <coughs> incidents uh, because I could and because I just, it was just lovely discovering those, like the, the Christmas scene that you mentioned. I'd spend a bit of time in um, uh, Vanuatu doing some work just before I started writing this book and I went to villages and remote villages too and I just became absolutely, um, you know, fascinated by their life and their and the way they still lived, you know, in the 21st century. Um, and also I'd been to New Guinea with Gabriel who's up the back there and my brother um, and sort of had a, a kind of a sense of, of that. But no, really, um, that may never well i don't think that christmas scene happened but it felt real to me and in fact that's what i loved about that process you know that it like it's almost as if it did happen and it feels real to the reader which i think is that's a lovely yeah. thing to say thank you
So just in terms of research, um, what did you do? How did you go about <coughs> tackling the research of this? Because it's a big project. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of story. So where did you start? At the beginning? <laughs> um, well, let me see. My father was um, half Italian. Didn't really talk about his Italian uh, heritage when we were children, not that I remember. In, um, 18, in 1980, 100 years after this all happened, there was a reunion in Lismore. First time my father kind of celebrated his Italian um, heritage. But it wasn't until um, like about 2001 when you could get dual citizenship for the first time, um, it's, you know, as an Australian. And my brother and I started... Um, so thought, well, that could be interesting for our children to have dual citizenship until we find out if they did have dual citizenship, they'd have to do military service. That put a bit of a damper on it. Um, so the research was... Um, it was a story that had, that had been written about, so this was published in 1980. And what is this for our This audience? is a, a little... Slim volume called Turmoil to Tragedy, Turmoil Tragedy to Triumph, the story of New Italy. So, the other part of the story I didn't tell was that when the Italians did arrive in Australia, um, and I reckon this is a really fascinating part of the story, they, um, Governor Park said, I'm going to disperse you, you can't stay as an Italian enclave, we don't do that here. So, they, took, they were forced to take work around New South Wales, but eventually they all, a lot of them gathered back in the Northern Rivers district of New South Wales, created a little community called La Sella Venezia, um, and sort of New Italy in common in common parlance. Um, yeah, where am I? Sorry, I've got a little lost research. research. Oh yeah, so <laughs> research. So so um, this book tells the story of the of the voyage and some of the statistics, but also mostly about what happened after they arrived in Australia. So that was one source. Um, I kind of knew the story. I knew there was a story and I knew the bones of it. I'm not a very good, I could never have done a PhD because I'm not a very good, I'm not a methodical researcher. I'm a, um, a, a researcher who finds things when they need them. So really, in a funny way, I just started writing. And then I got, I'd get to a point and go, what were they eating? So I spent a lot of time on Mr. Google, Dr. Google, researching stuff. That led me to read books about Australian migration, oh, Italian migration to Australia. Um, I read some, a couple of really good books. Geoffrey Dutton wrote a book called Queen Emma of the South Seas, who was a Samoan American yeah. woman who was up there in the, at the same time. And another book called uh, something of the Coral Sea, person, and I was going to bring it, but I didn't. Um, and they gave an account of the of the sort of the Pacific in that era. But generally, I just I really um, the research was really important and hard. And sometimes I would sit in your little. I just have to say that Fiona has um, is the birth mother to some extent of this book because I spent five years sitting in your little um, storeroom upstairs, coming down for coffees. Um, but sometimes I'd be up there for the whole day, maybe four or five hours, and I'd write maybe 20 lines, 100 words, because I got distracted by the um, research. But it was also research that I really needed to do. So I had to sort of slowly, slowly, slowly envelop myself in not only it, the, the Italian history, how the Italian nation came into being, um, what they ate, what it's like to be on a boat, you know, in 1880, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, um, clumsy I would describe yeah. my research as, but thorough. Well, I <laughs> and I never kept track of any of the sources. So <laughs> at certain times in rewriting the book, I'd have to go, oh, where'd that come from? And then I'd have to start again. But maybe that's a good thing because there's not too much detail in it. 
I've read historical fiction where you know that the author has fallen in love with the research process. There is so much detail in their books. But with your book, you've, it's a light touch. You feel like you're there. You, the reader doesn't think you're showing off with your research. The, research, the reader doesn't think that you're trying to pump, pump everything in there. It's, it's great. It's, it, I think that's, you've done that very well. But also your research led you overseas. Didn't oh, yeah. you have to yes. travel to destinations? Yeah, I found excuses yeah, to travel. That's right. I think, in, I think I heard that you said to Andrea, your very um, patient and understanding wife, you said that you, do, you were going to Italy for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, there was a family reunion and uh, of the Perrin family, which was my grand, great-grandfather's name that he lived under in Italy, he lived under Capelin in Australia. And um, Barry Summerlad, who's here in Carolyn, went to that um, reunion and Mick came too. Um, there's a man called um, Antonio Perrin in Italy who did this huge bit of research on the Perrin family del mondo of the world and then published this fantastic book. And then he decided that he would have a family reunion every five years. So I heard about it, Barry, I think, told me about it. I said, I'm going to walk out. Do you mind if I go? Andrea said, sure. But she had a, a picture in her head which was of this fabulous, you know, international week-long <laughs> celebration, you know, speeches and uh, deep history. And, you know, I, when I got the program, it said uh, mass at 11, lunch at 12, um, <laughs> And then I uh, hope you enjoy yourself you know, <laughs> in, in our wonderful country of Italy. Um, so I said, oh, well, it's for lunch. <laughs> and she was a little bit, uh, she thought, you're going? And I said, yeah, I'll be back for dinner. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, that was one of three trips I think I did to Italy. I mean, the first one was probably, was pretty exciting because I researched the, the rail network of, of Italy and um France in 1880, and that was the era of rail. You know, everyone was building rail lines. And so the first trip I went and I decided to follow the train lines that were in existence in 1880. So I went from Treviso to um, Bergamo to Milan to Turin to a little place called Ventimiglia and then jumped on a train to um, by Nice to Marseille, and that was the final destination. Um, yeah, so that like the on-the-ground research, and then I visited the little villages in the area of um, North Italy, of Veneto, each time I went as well. Um, I didn't really discover which village the Capulans came from until after I'd sort of finished writing the book, really. Well, until after my last visit to Italy. It was a little town called uh, Girano, I'm pretty sure. Um, but it was all the, the the Catholic Church was in charge of things there, so you have to go to every Catholic parish church and knock on the door and uh, introduce yourself to a grumpy priest who, you know, he says you know you want you want to go back two hundred years or one hundred forty years and find that information. Um, some of it came to light, and Barry helped with that too on his visits. But I think really what was most important was actually sort of just walking around mm. and seeing things and. Uh, walking through vineyards and going, Jesus, this soil is terrible. You know, it's 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 pebbles. It wasn't. It's not you know beautiful darling down soil. It was um, hard. Yeah. So you can imagine that if you were just a farmer trying to grow corn or grapes, well, it probably suited grapes because it was very friable. But um, yeah, just that that stuff and bumping into. I didn't. Well, I couldn't speak Italian, so that was having mock Italian conversations with um, people that you bumped into, yeah. So the 47 families, those that make this horrendous journey, they end up in like New Ireland, um, Cape Breton. Cape um, Breton Bre was named after, so the Marquis was from Brittany in yeah. France. So he gave it, he put a pin in the map and said, and gave it its name. Were you able to travel there? And what did you encounter? Because that's such a contrast. You couldn't think of two more diverse places. No. <laughs> um, the north of Italy, I'm not sure what the rainfall there is, not very much. Um, and New Ireland, the rainfall is between two and eight metres every year. So that's a lot of rain. Um, yeah, absolute 
contrast, and it's the climate of Hobart. In uh, oh, well, the climate of Hobart is northern Italy, and you, you can imagine what the climate on the equator is in um, New Guinea. Yes, I did get to go there. Um, thank you, Julian Pepperell, who Julian's a, um, a, what are you, a marine biologist with a special interest in marlin, and he had this mm, contact in Kokopo, which is on New Britain, called John Lau, um, who's a big marlin fisherman. And remarkably, uh, Julian sent him an email. John said, yeah, why not? You know, um, I'll take you for a ride. Um, John owns a huge emporium in um, Kokopo that sells everything from rice to motorcycles. Um, and he's got this fabulous game fishing boat. So Nick and I and Gabriel came with us because she speaks pigeon and had a connection to, the, to um, New Guinea. Um, yes, and John, so we got on John's boat. And he went, vroom, and nearly, I nearly fell off the back of the boat. Um, that was the most exciting part of the day, really. Um, <laughs> but it's so far and so remote that it took us two hours on a high-speed wow. um, marlin fishing boat mm -hmm. to get there. There's no roads to this place. There's no air service. There's no ferry service. The only way you can get there is begging a ride with someone. Um, yes, and we did arrive there. And then there's a little island called Lambon which shelters the bay, Port Breton, from the southeasterlies. And um, so we arrived there. I'm completely at the, we're completely at the mercy of John, really. What do we do now? A couple of um, boats, canoes put out from the shore. Said, g'day, what are you doing? Why are you here? What do you want? And John negotiated for a small fee um, that they would take us ashore, ashore and show us around. They knew the story. They knew the sights. So... Um, and it was absolutely beautiful, turquoise waters, um, still fabulous blue sky. This was, what month of the year was that, Mick and Gabriel? That July, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it was winter. We weren't wearing any jumpers, I can tell you. Um, it was both exciting and uh, bewildering, really, because mm -hmm. when we stepped ashore, I'm thinking there were supposed to be 300 Italians here mm -hmm. establishing a colony and the Marquis had said there'll be a cathedral, there'll be seal roads, there'll be a port, there'll be um, factories, houses. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be great. You know, you love it. Um, and there was one family there on this site that was supposed to support 300, um, living a self-subsistence -subsist lifestyle, um, a, a creek with beautiful, clear water flowing through it. But basically, but just and, but the mountain sort of range behind it just sort of jumped up sheer from the ground. A lot of um, coral, a lot of volcanic rock, a lot of coconut palms, mm -hmm. and nothing else. Uh, uh, the, obviously, the people who died, because a, a large number of the people who made the voyage and ended up there, they did. They died there. Did you get us? Was it? Was it a sad experience? Or did, did you feel moved or were there, you know, were there ghosts? Did it feel? I didn't, no, I felt, that's an interesting question. I, it was funny. It, I felt like a tourist, <laughs> to say the truth. Um, there were some grave sites. They took us to a side of a hill that faced east. The, the, the Catholics wanted to be buried facing east. Um, they were just mounds of volcanic rock um it, i felt moved but i didn't feel sad or um angry or anything like that i, I mean i just i was dumbfounded really that it was almost beyond comprehension that you were standing there and you were looking at this landscape and you couldn't even comprehend that a the marquis de ray had never been there um could have thought this was a good idea or B, how 300 Italians, I mean, most of them stayed on the ship when they got there. They did build a few um, buildings, but nothing much. I don't know. How did you feel, me that day? Oh, it was shocking. There was nothing there. Mm. I think... No, it wasn't, it wasn't very attractive. I mean, yeah. a great if you're a traditional... Yes, owner and, yes, a, yes, you yes. Know, and that's your land, but mm. 
for a, a European for a group of Europeans to or are they just bizarre? I mean their diet was so different. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, there was a grinding wheel on the beach. Yeah, and there were bricks. French bricks. We souvenired a couple. <laughs> and they were to build a cathedral. And I mean, he had the marquee had stocked the ship. There were four ships that actually went in total. This one, he stocked the ships with with enough bricks to build a cathedral, but um, no stone masons or anything like that. Or, uh, he also stocked it with something like um, I think there were two. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how many pairs. Maybe 200 pairs of pink slippers, because he had this idea that this was going to be. Um, a, like we, uh, Bill Metcalf, who's here, who's a historian, calls it a, a utopian colony. Um, if utopian means nuts, then um, <laughs> that would probably be true. Uh, but he had this vision. I mean, he was of the aristocracy, the French or aristocracy. They fell on hard times after the French uh, Civil War. And he was trying to, he had this um, vision of himself as still a, 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 a you know, a, a man of um, means, etc., etc. So he had designed this so there'd be three classes in the society: the noblemen and the noble women who would wear the slippers, the pink slippers; the um, bourgeois and middle class who would have nice houses, and then the peasants were the third class citizens who would live uh, eke out an existence and make him a lot of money. But that's why he'd send all this, as well as bricks, slippers. Yeah, it's, it's staggering to. And, and when you think about these these poor families who were destitute, trying to do the right thing by their by their families, do you think it was was it did they fall into a notion of a cult? Was it what's the difference between a utopia and a cult, or were they just swindled? Yeah, actually, I've, I mean, it's only in the last few weeks that I've started to, I mean, I don't think you know what you're writing about until you finish writing and then until you think someone's going to ask you <laughs> some hard <laughs> questions and you go, oh, okay. Well, I mean, I'm coming around to thinking it was, you know, that notion of group think. Yes. Um, I don't think it was a cult, but I do think they fell under a sort of a spell of this very sophisticated, it was a very sophisticated scheme. You know, they were writing, they had a journal. The French, you know, Marquis and his henchmen had a journal. They had posters which were really beautiful, you know, with the Virgin Mary standing atop a hill, sort of blessing everything in sight. Um, ships in the harbour, this was of the destination. Um, yeah, not quite a cult, but certainly something mysterious that caused a huge number of people to think this was a good idea and all agree to you know go to uh, go on a voyage to a destination they had no idea what where it was or what, what it was held. and what you've also done is a great job of, of fleshing out all of the different human responses where you've got one of the mothers in particular she's anti it from the very beginning there are other people who are who are believers almost right to the end so i think you've done a great job of exploring all of the all of humanity's responses to something like that and how we would respond either as you know as individuals to what we've a very strange circumstance. It's really bizarre when you start to really think about it. It's really odd. But Can I just comment on yes. that? I mean, I think one of the interesting things about writing historical fiction is um, you have to think, what were these people like? Were they another species? You know, there's a, there, well, I, I sort of was there going, well, can I, it's a bit like that thing about you can't write it unless you've experienced it. And then I thought, well, were they really that different? I mean, we all share a common humanity, a common set of emotions, a common ability to think, react, be happy, be sad, think something's a really good idea, think something's a really bad idea. Um, yeah, so I, th I decided that, you know, it wasn't a happy story and that there would be people there who would not be happy about it, being part of it but would go along with their husbands or whatever and there would be people who really believed in the scheme who would yeah. never let that 
belief drop. Mm, yeah, exactly. You did mention um, about the names. So there's your your family name is Kaplan, and also the Perrin. So just explain to us about how Kaplan gets to be an Italian name. It's an Italian word, Capanin, or Capain, in fact. Um, it's Venetian. So the family name, the ancestral name was Perin, um, which doesn't sound Italian. It sounds Austrian or somewhere French or something. Um, but in fact, in Veneto, the language doesn't use the vowels at the end of the names. It does in some cases, but not in all cases. And it's a tradition in Italy when a family gets too big or really big and everyone goes, no, we've got six Lorenzo Perrins. Can, we don't need the seventh, even though my grandfather named his son Lorenzo and, um, and then he named his son Lawrence. Um, yes, so the tradition is that they give them a nickname, the fat mob, the grossos, or in our case, the mob that wore caps or little hats, so not quite, which is Cap Capellini in Italian or Cap Capellin in Venetian. But the, fun, the interesting thing about Venetian is that it doesn't, it has two letter L's, one of which is silent. <laughs> so why would you bother? <laughs> Those Italians are tricky. The Italians are fascinating. Um, so our name is actually spelled C-A-P-E, this other letter, which is sort of like an L with a stroke through it, uh, I-N, and but that L is more of a <laughs> asthmatic, um, <laughs> mixed asthmatic, <laughs> it's in the genes, it's Capayin, not Capayin. Yeah. And when I went there and I said to the Italians at the lunch, I said, well, what is this, Perin, Capelin? And I go, ah, Steve, what do you mean? What are you talking about? It's simple. You're, you're Perin, you're Capayin. Don't you get it? I go, oh, thank you. <laughs> so you're both. Both, yes. And they were, and they're still Perrins and Capeans in Canada. Yeah. One final question from me. I could keep going and going, but uh, one final question from me, and then we'll go to the audience and also on Zoom. Um, we have the lovely um, Dominic, who's our young eight year old narrator. And he has a special book that he's been given. Can you tell the audience what that book is and why did you choose it? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's Pinocchio. Um, why did I choose it? Because I could. Because in my in my research, blah, 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 blah. I'm being, oh, Pinocchio, when was that written? 1881. Um, in fact, I have to confess, it was written and published the year that they arrived in Australia. So people say, what's true and what's not true in the book? Well, what's not true is that he couldn't have possibly had Pinocchio under his arm as he boarded the ship, but sorry. Um, forget, forget that, Liz, you have to believe it. Um, I just really, well, then I read Pinocchio and I thought, oh, it's a, I mean, it's a pretty wild story, really. It's a, it's a uh, uh, what do you call it? A tale that sort of teaches children not to be naughty, really, or the, you know the ramifications of um, having too much imagination or being too wild is that you know um, terrible things happen to you. And I just saw the, uh, a parallel between Domenico and Pinocchio, and thinking they're both cheeky little bastards. He, he's not quite as naughty as Pinocchio was, and I also wanted him. Okay, Domenico loves, he's at school. He's the first one in the family who's ever been to school. He loves learning. He's very smart. Um, I mean, as an eight-year-old, believe me, at first I thought an eight-year-old, or what can an eight-year-old know? And uh, some people said, well, they can't know much. But then I started listening to eight-year-olds being interviewed on ABC sometimes, and I went, that's amazing. You're very sophisticated. You're very articulate. Um, and there's a young fellow, if anyone's in a rugby league, who gets interviewed every Saturday on the rug, on ABC um, Radio, a young Christian, and he's he's about seven or eight, and he does a whole ten minute spot <laughs> about football, and you know who's going to win, who's playing well, who's not playing well, blah blah blah. So, okay, we nearly get. So, um, Pinocchio, yeah. So, I, and I, I guess I wanted um, Dominic. 
Domenico to have something that travelled with him from his school, from his love of school and love of reading. And even as an adult, his, chil his children, Domenico's in Australia, um, were very, uh, all of them became very well educated. One of them became a QC. Um, so I think he had a real, he had a real passion and a real belief in, in that. Well, it was one of those many lovely, oh, I turned myself off. No, turn yourself on. <laughs> what have I done? Have you turned yourself? Yeah. Turn myself. Oh, I turn myself. Oh, while you're doing that, can I say hello to Joe Burton in Malta? Um, Joe Lynch in London. Um, maybe Mark Gorder and Sharon in Sydney. Um, and anyone else who's who can't be here tonight, who's online. We got some international guests, and um, we love you. And Joe. I spent three months in Malta in Joe's apartment, so thank you. Writing part of this, so Joe, that was fantastic. I loved it, and I hated it. Um, <laughs> that's another story, um, but thank you immensely. So we're going to go to music before we do our um, questions. So that gives you more chance to think of questions and also to text in a question and. Chrissy, do you want to do the intro? Oh. Music or do you want me to do it? Giovanni Porta. I haven't got my glasses on. <laughs> do you want me to do it? <laughs> and, uh, and welcome, so welcome to Giovanni um, and David DeSandy. So this is um, Giovanni is someone I met through Lindy McAllister. Um, and we haven't had much contact, but he was really interested in the story. He was born in Australia, but he's a passionate Italian man, and he's written a lot of original songs, and this one is a song that he'll introduce himself, but he's a lawyer, but um, he's more importantly a musician and songwriter and a lover of Italian culture and history. Yeah. 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 Let me do this. Is Lindy here tonight? Where are you? Oh, hello, Lindy. Hello. Giovanni was here recently when I was here for Venero Amano's launch of his most recent book. Um, and then he kept referring to Giovanni in the background for answers to questions about um, Italy, even though Venny knows a lot about Italy. It was a lovely double act. Thanks, Steve. Um, Thank you, Steve, for... I think it actually has run a battery, you know. That's Sorry. right. I'll just do this. Sorry. <clears throat> Technology. Your best friend and your worst enemy when it doesn't work. Um, thank you, Steve, for inviting me here. Well, I probably invited myself. <laughs> <clears throat> but... Um, Steve's story, this, it's funny how threads come together, but um, when I was a kid growing up in North Queensland in the uh, 50s and 60s on the farm. Oh. Yeah, we'll put it upside down, sorry. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to the road crew, they make it work. <laughs> okay? Without a road crew and gaffer tape, there's no show. Um, so, growing up on a cane farm in North Queensland, my dad used to refer to an elderly Italian man on the farm next door. His name was Tom Sidigo, and his dad used to tell me that he came on a ship from Italy and the ship got lost or shipwrecked. Dad didn't know the story that well himself. I've got to say, my mum and dad came from Italy in 1932 and 35, respectively, from the other side of the peninsula, southern Italy, down near Bari Morfetta. And, um, and I had this story in the back of my head of this elderly fellow called Tom Sidigo and the story of this ship from Italy. And then later in life, I came across a bloke through Lindy Bell, a bloke called Steve Kaplan, which sounded like a pretty Aussie sort of skippy sort of bloke, Steve Kaplan. And it didn't come together until I found out recently that um, Steve Kaplan was actually Steve Kapelin, and which is a, names ending in IN are very common in the northeast of Italy, in that area where these people came from, Treviso up there, 
um, names like Capellin, Bordin, Fant Fantin, Guerin. So it's a very common Italian name. Um, if, a, if a person's name ends in IN, you know they're from that, that Veneto, Treviso region, correct, Steve? Yep. <clears throat> and um, so, and Steve, I'm, I'm so grateful, Steve, that you finished this book because about two years ago, Steve gave me a copy of a manuscript and said, can you read this? And I did. And then I spoke to him some months later and I said, how's it going, Steve? He said, oh, bugger it. I'm going to give up. I think his first publisher said, start again or something terrible like that. And I thought, how could you overcome such a kick in the pants as an artist like that? But um, next thing I see a couple of weeks ago, Steve's here at the book launch of Vanny Armano's book. And he told me he's finished his book, which was great news. So the story of the ship, um, this story, uh, the song that I've chosen tonight is about um, Italian migration. Steve's uh, story is a long way back in the 1890s. Um, I must say the book, um, I found it I found it harrowing, Steve, the, the suffering in it, um, the fact that you can go to that place and there's nothing there. There's some bricks and a stone wheel on the beach and all of people's dreams and emotions are just, there's nothing to show. Um, <clears throat> And I would recommend that if you're driving somewhere on the north coast between Lismore, around about there, Coffs Harbour, there's a great little stop and it's called New Italy. And that's all that's left of, it's more than it's left in New Guinea. Um, there's a, a little museum, a gift shop, a cafe. It's, it's, it's well worth a stop. So um, the story I've chosen, the song, is from an album I recorded a year or two ago called The Giovanni Theories and the song's called Hannibal Cross the Great Divide. So the genesis of the song is that um, some years ago I was sitting in a coffee shop in Clayfield and with mum and dad having a sandwich and in through the door walked <clears throat> a large Italian gentleman and his name was Annibale Boccabella. Now Annibale translates to Hannibal. I'll tell you a bit more about that later, but um, Anibale was well known around Brisbane, a uh, new farm person. He was one of the founders of what is now the UNFE club over at um, the Italian club. Uh, UNFE stands for Associazione Nazionale Federazione Italiane. So it was a club for migrants, Wyandra Street over at Newstead. And when he walked through the door, Dad said, Mum, Mum, that's a nibble there. And mum said, oh, Paul, what? Because my dad was always claiming lost dogs everywhere, you know. <clears throat> but when he met him, we knew that there was some connection here. Dad said, I haven't seen him for 56 years. So they had a bit to talk about. Mum and I said, you two better do some talking. So in summary, they were interned um, when Mussolini joined the war in June 1940, unnaturalised Italians were automatically um, enemy aliens. And so they were rounded up. Um, the authorities just came and told them, you've got to go. So they were taken off farms or whatever. They were just trying to earn a living. But um, they were rounded up and they, they weren't in concentration camps, but they were sent to work camps. And <clears throat> one day, Dad had met Boccabella in this camp and then Boccabella went missing. He never saw him again for 56 years. And the mystery was what happened to Boccabella. And the mystery was revealed in the coffee shop in Clayfield, but I'm not going to tell you what the mystery was. But um, And I thought about Anibale. I thought, what a, what a big name to call someone, Hannibal. You know, the only Hannibal people know about is bloody Hannibal Lecter. And I haven't seen that silly movie about someone who eats people or something. Anyway. Um, Hannibal, the original Hannibal, was a Carthaginian general. Can I just tell him a bit more? And he, <laughs> yep, and he, um, he gave Rome a punch in the nose. Um, he was based in Carthage, and he decided to go and give the Romans a bit of what for on their home turf. So Hannibal, with his elephants, marched across the north of Africa, up through Spain, through Gaul, and came into Italy where? But across the Alps with, with 150,000 men and a whole lot of war elephants. 
He was the first person to use elephants as a, a tool of war. And I thought, well, Hannibal crossed the Great Divide, and this Hannibal, well, our Hannibal crossed the Great Divide, and that one crossed the Alps. So this is a song called Hannibal Crossed the Great Divide. Across the ocean, then the great divide. Now they meet for coffee on the other side. June 1940, Mussolini joined the war. Italians down under, enemy aliens for sure. Sergeant Nally said, Sorry, Paul, you just gotta go on the train to somewhere he didn't even know. They first crossed the ocean. Then a great divide. Now they meet for coffee on the other side. Rounded up in Stanthorpe on the western line. Shipped off in work games, few at a time. A nibbler couldn't take all that not knowing why he was there and where he was not going. When his amigo went first, he asked for a letter. Tell me where you are, if it's any better. The letter came back, censored to bits. All this not knowing scared him out of his wits. When his turn came, he jumped off his train. For 56 years, Polly didn't see him again. What of a nibbler? Was he alive, was he dead? Or some art task fired with a price on his head? First cross the ocean, then the Great Divide. Now they meet for coffee on the other side. Hey, Meeting in a coffee shop, suburban clay field. Paulie sprung a nibbler, all was revealed. Farm living, shed working, the money was a rip off. He left in a hurry, and a neighbor gave a tip off. Italians on the run, with nowhere to hide. A nibbler, no elephants, crossed the Great Divide. New farm covered him, sheltered his tracks. Hard working, living, never look back. First cross the ocean, then the Great Divide. Now they meet for coffee on the other side. Now, Polly and Anibale, they've crossed their Great Divide. They have coffee and cannoli on the other side. Probably a new farm deli or Valentino something. <laughs> Now two others meet, sharp suits, marble foyers, the pride of their lives, their sun city lawyers. First cross the ocean, then the great divide. Now they meet for coffee on the other side. First cross the ocean, then the great divide. Now they meet for coffee on the other side, on the other side, on the other side, on the on the, on the other side. Thank you. Look, that was, um, whoops, sorry, COVID tape. Um, that was fantastic. Um, tonight has been a really um, wonderful um, launch full of love, um, full of song, full of story. 
Um, Steve, I really do think when I first read um, that very early draft of this, I didn't realise that you'd be on such a massive journey. Um, it would take you this long to finish, but that when you did, it would be um, so full of love and so appreciated by everyone. We don't have time for questions from the audience, but we will meet Steve at the signing table where we can ask him our questions personally. And I have some questions from the Zoom audience and I will be giving those to um, Steve at the signing table so he can answer you himself there. And I'm gonna turn the camera on to Steve so that he can um, do his final words. So let's just give me that. I'll just move the camera. Okay, I'll be um, brief. Chrissy, I just wanted to thank a few people and acknowledge yeah. a few people. Um, in particular, Matthew Wengert, who's up the back there. Where are you, Matthew? He's the, and also published, uh, and also books, who's published the book. And uh, he showed a lot of, he asked me about the story. I told it to him. He said, yeah, that's good. Let's do it. Um, unfortunately, my fantastic editor, Bianca Milroy, who really, um, I just learned so much from Bianca. She's, you know, a third of my age, but um, she couldn't be here tonight. She's sick, which is really sad. She really wanted to be, be here. And I wanted to bring her up and talk about yeah. the relationship between um, editing and writing. So that's really sad. But hello, Bianca, if you're watching. She is. And um, Tricia Head, who designed the cover, um, Beautiful cover, and she's also sick. I feel like an abandoned child. Um, <laughs> the family's not here. Um, it, they didn't. Uh, they, they did not come because they didn't want to. We've got a great, a fabulous relationship. Um, and the other two, there's a lot of people in the audience who I would thank for. Sorry, Chrissy, I'm standing up That's for right. in the camera. Um, for being readers and uh, listening and giving feedback. Um, but in particular, two people I want to thank. Um, one is Andrea. <laughs> um, it's not a lot, Andrea, but um, you've been, well, Andrea and I have been together for, for God, only how many years? Um, a lot and very a lot of very good years, 47 or something like that. Um, but the last 10 has probably been the a bit of a trial at times for Andrea, but I couldn't have got through it without you. So thank you. You've been fantastic and always willing to um, give advice. <laughs> <laughs> is Jess here tonight? Yeah. yeah, Jess. And Jess is a great reader, i got to tell you. Um, that's my daughter. Um, I want to thank her. But the most of well, this is not for Jess, sorry. This is for someone else. <laughs> Jess knows I love her. I'll, I'll give her something very special. But no, this is for um, Fiona because Fiona and Kev, avid reader, the bloody amazing, I mean, I don't think this book could have been written without avid and all the connections through avid. <laughs> I sent some Fiona some notes last week going, oh, I met Matthew through um Jennifer, who works here, I met Bianca uh, accidentally through Matthew when we were doing another um, book thing, and I met Trisha Head through a book club um, that I was part of that Jennifer was also part of. So in a way, this is a giant um, avid reader kind of celebration of this book, but in particular, Fiona and Kev, I sat in their storeroom upstairs for, I don't know how many years did you count? No. <laughs> Um, and, um, I mean, that just allowed me to come to work and you've got to actually come to work to write a book. And so this is deeply felt. Thank you, thank you to you, Fiona. Oh, Big you. hand for you, Fiona. Thank you. So on that note... On that note, um, thank you everyone for coming. We will um, get you to stay in your seats though while we let Steve out first, otherwise it'll take us a while to get to him. So um, maybe perhaps now we will get Steve to go through the room like a bride at his wedding as we clap him one final time. So thank you, Steve. Now that he's gone, we will be able to mob him. Just um, give me a moment as I let people out of Zoom. Thank you, everyone.